Hey guys, so uh, welcome to the Dead Horse podcast uh, and I'm Vivek and with this with me this week are Arvind, hello, and Tejas. Hello. So, as everybody knows, the Game Developers Conference is well underway in San Diego and uh, we've had some pretty interesting announcements this year that I think are going to shake up the industry in a pretty major way, especially uh, for independent developers. So yeah, we're, we're basically going to be talking about uh, the announcements made by Unreal, Crytek, and Unity. Uh, they've each announced, uh, you know, their the new version of their engines. Like it's kind of been a coming out party for all their engines, and it's like they've, they've done it in a pretty big way. Unreal announced that they're changing the way uh, the financing uh, model works, the licensing deal for their engine will work. It's going to be nineteen dollars a month, and five uh, percent of the gross that your game uh, that your games. Uh, whatever your game makes, uh, Crytek to <laughs> in a move that's clearly calculated to one up uh, UDK. The next day announced that their engine would uh, take ten dollars a month and none of the none of your proceeds from the game that you make. And uh, Unity announced Unity Five, which has dynamic lighting. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, different let's, let's... type of dynamic lighting compared to what we had before. And physical base shading, like Unity also announced physical base shading. So. Oh my God! What a what a great evolution in video game engines. I'm not yeah. a huge fan of Unity, if if you haven't guessed yet. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was actually looking at comments on PC Gamer, like the PC Gamer Facebook page, and the Crytek reveal had the like the surprisingly the most excited gamers because, uh, like Crysis, Crytek has sort of the handle on the you know, Uber graphics. Kind of yeah, card. So everyone look, looks at CryEngine and they think, oh my god, best graphics. So yeah, it was pretty surprising because I think most developers were excited about the Unreal reveal, but our gamers were more uh, sort of excited about the the CryEngine reveal. Yeah, like I think I think that's that's interesting. But uh, let's not consider the gamer perspective for a moment. We'll get back to that. But from a developer perspective. Even I was, I'm excited by both. I think Crytek and Unreal choosing to use this model is going to affect the way games are made in this generation in a very, very big way because uh, both those engines can be like can be used to make games on consoles as well. So I think it's going to open up a completely different kind of like market for games. Like it's, it's yeah, I'm, I I don't want to jump the gun and say that nineteen dollars a month is affordable for everyone, but it will open up the market to a lot more people not to everyone certainly because for some, for a lot of people $20 a month or even $10 a month is a lot of money but there are a lot more people who will be able to access these engines now and be able to make games on them uh the flip side of that <clears throat> of course is that this might lead to a saturation of really shitty games like no as compared sorry, to like, what think, we have now right like in complete contrast well no to think what about we have now. think about what you huh. see with flash right I don't think like uh, I actually think the number of bad games is going to stay the same because like a, a bad game in Flash is a bad game in Unreal. Like it's not like magically just changing engines would make the game better. What I actually think is that this this would be a great move for uh, like students and everything because now a student can like a programming student can just look at the source code and like get a leg up and see you know see how it's done. So, like, in case they want a job in the AAA industry, you know, if they want to be like the 16th hire of Irrational or something, so then it's a it's a great leg up for them. So yeah. Yeah, for sure, it is it is a big leg up for them. And like, I I take I took a look at a bunch of uh, videos that Unreal released yesterday, uh, uh, showing tutorials for their new toolset, and it yeah. th- like they've made some big improvements from yeah, that visual uh, scripting language uh, really excites me like that is the part which i'm most excited about like forget the graphics because i know that i won't be able to uh, fully utilize that uh, all the like techniques and all that stuff in there but that visual scripting thing really like caught my eye i was like i, I might actually try this yeah they've done some really cool things and then uh, <laughs> so yeah like I'm, I'm excited to see where this goes uh, and whether people in India, whether studios in India are going to try and 
take advantage of this and start making games for platforms other than mobile? <laughs> I, I think uh, we are going to see a lot of uh, mid-tier or uh, mid-level uh, gaming studios in India. Not so sure about India, but at least uh, in uh, the world over who will take advantage of this. And uh, I'm being a little optimistic here when I say, uh, say it, but I do hope that we will see more uh, just uh, more uh, original IP games coming out as uh, opposed to the general... Uh, you know, sequel fest that we get from uh, AAA studios. I mean, I actually think that you will get all the sequels and stuff, but what you might get is like more uh, sort of, you know, a game, more games uh, of the scope of Gone Home, like something like that, you know, which are not really like uh, aiming to be like 20 hour cinematic uh, experiences, but are yeah. more like a like couple of hours, three hours, something like that. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to say that we'll get rid of the sequels. I mean, uh, you know, that is a huge business. Uh, you know, uh, people buy these games and the sequels are made for a reason. There is a very hardcore market for it. But in general, uh, for peop- uh, for the audiences that want something more, uh, I think that they'll see more options. And options that, uh, you know, like taking Gone Home as an example, uh, for people who care about uh, visual fidelity that, you know, Gone Home may not have been as amazing an experience as something that uh, could be made on one of these other platforms. So I think that there's, there's a good possibility that we'll just see, you know, uh, prettier uh, indie games in general. Uh, I mean, though, obviously you still need artists, you know, so even if like, even if Unreal 4 is very uh, inexpensive, uh, for you, you still need like a lot of artists if you are really planning on taking on, for example, Bioshock Infinite on its own game. Yeah. So yeah, it's not yeah, it's not completely like you know like we have removed all barriers, and now anyone can make whatever they want. It's not that yet, but yeah, it's definitely a major step forward, especially for uh, yeah. like I in my like because I am a programmer, so I think it's a great step forward for programmers to having the the full source code available on github yeah i mean even, even if like for somebody like me like i can possibly learn from it even if i don't plan to use it i can just uh, subscribe uh, because like no their po- licensing is pretty unique like if you there's no possibly uh, about it you will definitely learn from it uh, yeah obviously uh, yeah uh, yeah so their licensing goes like if you want if you pay just for one month uh, you get that engine, you can keep it. You just won't get the updates. And that's yeah. fine. So, I think that's a pretty good deal, actually. Yeah. I mean, yeah, definitely with that. Because, like, uh, because like some independent developers, uh, like, you know, might not have a stable income. So, like, so like luckily, it means even if you don't, like, have money to pay for the engine for, uh, like, two, three months or maybe even six, you just don't get the updates. You still have something you can make your game on. And when you have twenty dollars later on, you can renew that, and you'll get all the updates in, in the interim. yeah. You'll get all the updates you missed. So it's a pretty good deal, IMO. Like yeah, in my opinion. Uh, I think that the like the interesting thing that that like like I said earlier, the interesting thing for me to see is going to be how many uh, how many studios in India can will will now take a look at this these new licensing models, these new business models, and say okay. Let's try and experiment making game with making games on like on PCs, not consoles. I like I think th- those are like maybe a li- that will still be a little bit more expensive yeah. to make, but at least try and make kind of the mid tier game on PC and see whether we can get like move sales that way. Yeah, because in that sense, this is a pretty exciting possibility, right? Like a mid tier studio in India. I think some of them are primed to make games using these platforms. Uh, I am not as optimistic. I mean, I hope it happens. But for some reason, I just can't take the final leap and say it will happen. I agree. I do not see uh, a lot of people in India it, like exactly going for this immediately. Uh, it, it's just the general mentality is that, you know, mobile is the way to go. Mobile is the future. And... You know, even as investors, people, you know, look, you know, that's what uh, someone who has no touch to games, that's what they see. 
you know, in the media, and that's what they're, uh, you know, uh, most, yeah. uh, what's the word for it? They're, they're most, uh, that, that's what, you know, that, that they uh, receive a lot of news for, that, you know, this mobile studio did this and made X amount of money, or, you know, this mobile studio makes X amount of money per day. And as an investor, that seems like a more lucrative uh, option than, hey, three years and, you know, high production values and make an awesome game and trust these guys to do something. And, you know, it, it's, you know, it just, just from a person who doesn't play games from their perspective, I don't see, you know, at least from outside investment that happening. But from guys who can, you know, afford to like go, you know, work by themselves for a while, I do hope that there's some people, out, you know, out in India here who will take that risk. And I, you know, that, that'd be epic. Yeah, uh, I was saying that Arvind and I are taking that risk right now, but I think in a lot of cases, uh, especially for Arvind, because I think at least on him there is actually pressure because people know what he's making. Uh, I don't think people are going to notice whether or not the projects we make succeed or fail because the bar- barometer for success is insanely high. Success is Angry Birds and anything less is not really to be take, like to be noted. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. like people, <laughs> yeah, investors for sure. Like investors won't even take you seriously. Like you need like some sort, like uh, like you need to be like dealing in millions before before like investors try like take you seriously. Either that or you yeah. need to be like following every trend to the T. So so you are like okay, what's the latest trend? So it's free to play. So like it has to be free to play, and then like it's mobile, so it needs to be mobile, and then whatever that's happening right now. Speaking of which, Arvind, have you decided finally how you're going to monetize Unrest? Yeah, there's going to oh, be yeah. Uh, yeah, there's going to be a fifth dialogue option, like fifth or sixth, depending on how many options are there, that you can buy for 99 cents and it will solve everything. Like all scenarios, oh, everything. Dude, Just talk perfect. to anyone in the game. Yeah. Like there should be like a, a hex kind of a code that's encrypting the option, and then suddenly <laughs> when it when it's unlocked, all you see is 42. <laughs> I mean, Anybody I was actually thinking zero four by one. You have to wait for twelve hours. <laughs> Every time you finish a chapter, you have to wait for twelve hours, and if you don't want to wait for twelve hours, you have to pay maybe ninety nine cents, a dollar ninety nine, whatever. But anyway, yeah, let's see what happens. I guess like there's a couple of promising developers that uh, like one of them uh, made a sort of cyberpunkish game recently. Yeah, his name is Anish Patel, I think. Yeah. I don't know the name of his game because like yeah, like my memory isn't the best right now. Pull it something something. Okay, I haven't seen yeah. this one. Yeah, let me look it up actually. Just hang on a second. I don't know. Like in the meantime, they just I don't know, what, what do you what do you think yeah, uh, how do you think this hacker. impacts? Yeah, bullet soul hacker. Bullet, bullet soul hacker, cool. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I haven't seen this. Uh, uh, can you link me? I'll check it out after the podcast. <clears throat> is this by a, a student or is it by like a professional game developer? I have no clue what he's doing. Like, this is the the link. If you'll find. I... He's an independent game developer at a studio called Narcissist Reality. Yeah, that's just oh, him. Yeah. That's like, it's I've not seen this one. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, as far as I'm aware, it's just him and maybe like one or two other people that, but like not like a you know incorporated company kind of thing. As far as I'm aware, okay, so yeah, like I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I saw the screenshots for this a while back. I remember this, but I hadn't yeah. read about what the game was. Yeah, he actually uses Unity, so he, like this might be a really great chance. Like all these engines for developers uh-huh. like him. Yeah. Unity, f- <clears throat> I'm sure a lot of people are excited about Unity 5. And yeah. the main problem like, I that th- I saw is that there's still no, like the main UI of Unity sucks. So that yeah, is that they've not, uh, they've not done anything to improve their level design tool sets for people who aren't, uh, who aren't buying the pro version, you know, mm. their level design tool sets are pretty awful for Unity. Yeah. I mean, compared to, yeah, the like, Unity was sort of overshadowed, but like, then it is also the incumbent in this. So we shouldn't count Unity out because lots of like, uh, I actually think that lots of flagship games for Unity are going to release this year, like Wasteland 2, then Project Eternity, and 
and like torment is also going to be made Your on imagination is ready to check it might actually yeah. become like the rpg engine like you know sort of the infinity engine of the older times like just the return of like infinity engine games or like yeah that <laughs> yeah so i mean like i certainly oh, have high hopes for wasteland 2 and like project eternity oh no yeah. i absolutely have high hopes for all of those games too i do not think that's going to lead to a renaissance of old school rpgs <coughs> oh yeah i i mean as long as this like obsidian and inexile can keep making them like yeah i'll i'll be happy like i don't want a like a full scale kind of you know this is the new thing kind of yeah i'd rather yeah. see more than I'd like to see more studios than just them making it, just for variety's sake. Okay, I I just looked up uh, uh, Ansh Patel. He's working on a game called Exist. We should put a link Exist. to this in our uh, podcast. It it the game looks kind yeah. of funky. Okay. Yeah. Here, there's a link. Uh, you guys take a look at it. We'll put a link in the YouTube video. Seems cool. Interesting. What the? I don't know what I'm looking at right now on this main page, but. Uh... Looks kind of interesting. The game. Oh, he got. He's also featured on Rock Paper Shotgun and Ars Technica and Indie Static. Interesting. Hmm. Here's a. Getting that. He's on Rock Paper. I have absolutely no idea what this game is. Like looking at the page. He's on Rock Paper Shotgun. Yeah. Like, most anticipated games of 2014. He's on that list. Oh wow. Oh yes, yes, yes. I remember. Yeah. There is hope. You know. Not bad. I'm, so, I'm okay, kind yeah, of happy. Okay. We'll link to this. Yeah. We'll link to this. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Kind of happy that people are actually out there doing things that are interesting. Yeah, that's true. Ah, uh, so yeah, like I think yeah, at this point, like we sort of need the dust to settle to figure out just what exactly are the limitations of each license from each company. Yeah, for sure. Like I think we're going to see. Ah, uh, like it's, this is this is the beginning. There's no way to yeah. predict what's going to happen next, but it it'll be fun to see what happens next either either way, right? Yeah. Ah. Uh, I hope it leads to. I hope this leads to a renaissance of the mid-tier kind of risky game that died out during this generation. Mm-hmm. Like that was a big trend that we saw from the beginning of this console generation was that the mid-tier game kind of got butchered because of the kind of spend that the high-tier games had. The like especially on consoles, the mid-tier game died a really, really gruesome death. And I think something like this can bring it back. You wow. know, the kind of interesting mid-tier game with a kind of slightly Off track, off keel, off kilter idea. Uh, yeah, But more important, make... like uh, a game that doesn't need to sell like five million copies to be like financially viable. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, nowadays even five million isn't enough for for many. Yeah, yeah. nowadays yeah. I think I'll, unless you sell fifty million copies, like unless you're a Grand Theft Auto, spending money like spending money for a big studio is like it's it's not viable anymore. You know, yeah. it's weird. because even if the even if the development costs are 40 million to market the game so that people go out there and buy it like the marketing budget becomes close to 50 or 60 million dollars which is insane you know yeah uh yeah, yeah. and i mean uh yeah and sony is sort of making its console more open uh like a lot publishing lots of independent games so i think like there is a like at least from platform holders There is a sense that yes, like the landscape of the industry is not going to stay the same. Like, They are opening up. Like you have your Fifas and your Maddens and your Assassin's Creed. So I don't know how long like Assassin's Creed is going to go because like they are just milking it like crazy. What like three new Assassin's Creed games every year or something? Speaking of which, the new Assassin's yeah. Creed photos leaked. Apparently, it's in revolutionary. They said during the French Revolution in Paris. Yeah. You know, funny thing is, like, uh, pandemic. Their last game was also set in the French Revolution. You know, I'm just—they're not implying anything, but you know. <laughs> yeah. What, what what was that game called? Uh, Saboteur. Yes. Saboteur, right? That was the name. Saboteur was set during World War Two, not during the French Revolution. I'm pretty certain it was like because. a uh, part like the parts of territory you liberated were in no no it said in paris it said in paris but yeah, it said yes. during world war 2 in paris oh okay 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 you are yeah. you are fighting against nazis in that game oh yes yes of course how could i forget that but yeah like oh, you know one a nazi in one game a nazi in 50 other games to kind of confuse <laughs> <laughs> but yeah 
okay yeah now okay now yeah now it makes sense yes yes okay. so anyway yeah like it's it's good i guess like i mean like people were basically calling on them to make this game ever since assassin's creed 2 like nobody really asked for like more like Ezio games or like more uh, whatever the hell they did next with, with Connor or whoever the hell that guy. You know, but yeah. I mean, I imagine they can probably milk one game from uh, like a feudal Japan or a Chinese setting. I imagine there's a lot to be done yet. Like, you know, yeah. like, something like Assassin's Creed isn't going to die out anytime soon. Yep. Unless they, they make three or four really bad games back to back and they haven't done that yet. I don't count them out though. Like that's a very distinct possibility. By the by Yeah, the well it's of, possible yeah. because of the amount of fatigue, right? No yeah, one developer I mean, can be expected to deliver at that level of quality year after year. It's it's hard. Yeah, exactly. It's not an easy thing yeah. to do. Yeah. Like it's they're basically beating their developers over the head. I think the one reason that I'm kind of optimistic about that is apparently internally in Ubisoft. The idea is that uh, they're going to alternate between Assassin's Creed and Watch Dogs now. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, like, uh, Ubisoft it has, ha, like, recently they have a very annoying habit of merging the design of every one of their games. Because Assassin's Creed 4 was sort of, it, it was almost as much Far Cry 3 as it was Assassin's Creed. <coughs> and then you have, like, yeah, so... Like, and all of these games with like, you know, a million things to collect and a million recipes to craft, they did tend, they might actually end up feeling the same after a while. They end up becoming a too many cooks kind of game. They put in, a, yeah. like, it's basically a, a, a thousand very, very smart people throwing yeah. every idea at the wall. And like, when, when people who are that good at what they do start throwing ideas at a wall, a, a good number of those ideas will stick. Yeah. You know? Uh Unfortunately, even even people who are working at that level will get tired sometimes, you know. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> because you cannot nobody, like just it's just a human limitation. You cannot keep on producing, like you know, like the ex even if you keep on producing excellent stuff, the bar every time gets raised higher and higher. So yeah, it becomes not, insane. Yeah. At, at at some point eventually, like this is what Activision is doing for Call of Duty now. There yeah, are three yeah, studios yeah. who are going to be working on Call of Duty titles annually. Yeah. But, yeah, and I believe uh, this Call of Duty sales were less than the last ones, so there might have been. But a they've been week. saying that like every year, it's not it's not a significant drop, you know. Yeah. Call of Duty Ghost is the first one that's not sold well as like it's, but it's still done a billion dollars worth of business. Yeah. So at that point. Yes, it's not selling as well as it, it it generally does, but it's done a billion dollars worth of business. What I mean, yeah. none of those Infinity Ward is not shutting down. Irrational oh, has yeah. shut. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no. The the thing is that like yeah, like you know everything sort of. So this might be the beginning of the end. It might not be the end, but might be the beginning of the end. Like, you know. No, but see, I think that I think that Activision has taken steps to remedy what is going on, right? They've made it a three-year dev cycle now for Call of Duty. So, there are going to be three separate Call of Duty franchises now. Like, uh, I you know, the, had a really weird uh, vision of an Alan Wake and, and Call of Duty crossover because you said it's taken steps to remedy the situation. And I was just <laughs> wondering <laughs> what a game like that would be. Like, like <laughs> speaking, speaking of remedy, I am excited to see Quantum Break, which is their new game. Oh, yeah, uh, I, like I, I totally would... forgot that. Like, is that for PC or it's just for like? It's a it's an Xbox One exclusive. I think oh, that's really oh. dumb because eventually they will release on PC and actually make money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. The GDC and this this generation has just become a lot more interesting because of those engine announcements made at GDC. I mean, uh, we, uh, I mean, there's a clear trend that uh, game development is just not going to be like even like ma mass markets are not uh, because so far what's happened is that mass markets in consoles and PC were generally restricted to people who like you know big studios like you needed to have a certain amount of marketing budget to be able to even think about tapping the markets. But the way it's going, it looks like anybody has a shot. Like it, it might not actually be that anybody has a shot, but it's definitely looking that way. It's starting to look that way, which yeah. is I like. I think I think it's interesting. Uh, yeah. The other thing, like that, I think there is there's going to happen is we're going to start seeing a, a genuine symbiotic relationship between the big games and the smaller independent games. Like 
you as much as as much as i i sometimes like to rag on uh like the the super large triple a games like call of duty and stuff like that, that they do serve a purpose in the long run you know like they bring the audience and eventually the audience that that comes to those games will start bifurcating and start looking for things that are more interesting and then start exploring different kinds of games yeah i mean though just like uh, to say that like this might not actually be true like we don't know like we don't have any research to cite or anything but yeah that's what we feel in any case i mean it it's generally true that the largest audience goes to play these games right yeah. they bring the crowd yeah. and the crowd eventually dissipates and like those that want to play more games will start looking for things that are kind of different from this yeah from what uh, they're this playing this is actually interesting because uh, what uh, this actually makes is because that all of the store fronts in games are in a state of flux right now there's no storefront yeah. with a perfect design like steam has its flaws especially with like uh, lots of games coming in now getting greenlit and then like console storefronts have their own annoyances and like some some literal annoyances with the advertisements so i mean yeah it's it's go- it's even the storefronts are not going to be completely unchanged or like for sure yeah like the store the storefronts are also going through a big period of flux like i think we're going to see changes in the way you can publish games not just on steam but on gog and on the humble store and like yeah. the other sto- store fronts it also looks like steam is going to be removing green light yeah uh, it's it's looking like that at least like there's no confirmation that that is going to happen yeah it, it, there, there think, are certain signs that it might actually be removing it yeah so, and i think once green light goes away i think it's going to be really interesting to see how that affects independent games does that yeah. lead to this glut of really really shitty games on steam or does it lead to you know like just a huge variety in content and people can choose what they want to play uh, i mean like there's uh, still there's lots of shitty games on steam right now i mean like have you guys played bad rats or like the other 500 <laughs> mobile to pc ports that are like on this for sure there are there are some really bad games on steam but i i think that uh, for the most part it it was hard even for those bad games to get on steam i don't think we've seen the worst of the pack yeah. you know we've not I mean, seen yeah, the, that's the, the key the, thing like uh, having trash on the store is okay as long as it sinks quickly like if if trash yeah. is on your uh, main storefront for on or like on your rolling banner thingy for a week that's going to hurt steam in a big way yeah i mean if if trash uh, like sinks quickly then no it's not a big that much of a bother so yeah like it's a, it's a very big uh, tightrope to walk because let's assume that if if steam goes the way of uh, google play so they have their store and they like instead of the default new releases tab being selected they make top sellers the default selection that single change might actually change a lot of fortunes in this industry that's how big steam is right now yeah for sure like so, i i yeah. think I think that's also the case the other thing i think that i i hope happens is we start seeing a real competitor to steam on on pc at least yeah you know there there nothing like that exists i was hoping for a while i had a i had a small hope briefly that origin would be that competitor <laughs> but that hope has been has been taken outside into to the barn and been shot in the head repeatedly <laughs> yeah i i know that that is not going to happen uh but Yeah I like I don't know something has got to give at this point steam oh, is dominating yeah, like at this point like we should probably congratulate the people at EA because they managed to pull off an in, impossible uh, engineering feat by making sim city offline so yeah oh uh, yeah i mean we yeah, were told that, it couldn't be done like they said it it couldn't be done they said it was impossible but this because of the kind of to, uh, yeah pull yeah, it because off because of the kind of technology the game was using it needed yeah. to be online apparently yeah. it doesn't anymore so Yeah, apparently, impossible. like spaceships from outer space powered SimCity before, but now your PC can do. Like, that's that's the level of breakthrough we are talking about. Well, I thought you were going to congratulate EA for making you not want to buy Dragon Age Inquisition despite it looking so good because if you can only play it on Origin. But yeah, you know, yeah, I mean that's <laughs> that. Too, right? Yeah, that's that. I mean, at this point, like I I would only buy Dragon Age Inquisition if. <laughs> it got released to like absolutely rave reviews like uh, sort of like yeah, like the the scale of rave i'm talking about is something like how the last of us was received 
in which like absolutely everyone with a console was like oh yes this is the one you know something like that okay like, fair enough fair enough uh yeah i don't know like i i am kind of torn at this point i really want to play dragon age inquisition but i'm probably going to end up getting it on a pc and hating myself because for the first time ever i'll be installing origin on my computer uh i wasn't going to get it but then later on the witcher guys announced that witcher 3 isn't coming out this year so dragon age inquisition is going to be my my big rpg game for this year uh yeah yeah uh, yeah i i hope bioware does well because i think at this point bioware knows that if they screw this up dragon age is pretty much finished as a franchise if bioware screw this up well see again like it depends on what you mean by screw it up like yes people have problems with mass effect 3 people have problems with with dragon age 2 yeah. they're bad games by bioware standards yeah definitely yeah they're that's not still bad games a by pretty a great standards. game yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah that's a bad that's game problem. by bioware standards i think they'll still be fine if they make a bad game then they're in trouble uh, i'm pre- i'm actually thinking if they make another dragon age 2 they might be in real trouble because yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, like I think we strayed super far from the topic, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I think that's also cool. let, let let's stray even further if you want to. <laughs> uh, has anyone played Titanfall? Because I just like I was I was half interested in that, but then I saw that it's in like like it's an online shooter and it's on Origin, so it kind of just went over that horizon for me that I make the effort to buy a game, <laughs> and on top of that the. the premium which ea charge indian customers because apparently like we are just stupid uh well and i decided not to buy titanfall the minute i realized that it was not only was it multiplayer only it's multiplayer only in a in a kind of not very fun way you know there's yeah there's no incentive to to continue playing that game there's no like there's no persistent world like planet side 2 which you and i played at least You know, when whenever we went back into that game, we could see the effect that our fighting had had on the world. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like there's a persistence to the map that we were on, and people were taking posts and losing them, and those fights felt like fun. Like there's nothing like that in Titanfall. You're just yeah. playing death matches. Yeah. yeah, but see, and all the gameplay I've heard is fantastic. It's still kind of like okay, it's a shooter, but I can move really fast, and yeah. robots. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like I it's. I don't think it's still game. as fast as I mean, Quake or Doom or something like that. Doom Deathmatch. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, yeah. I haven't seen any one is two one comparison or anything. But yeah. And I mean, the robots like in a, like they they sort of look cool, but yeah, I'm not sure if that alone is enough to just. Like, especially like for me the price because they charge what three thousand five hundred rupees. That's at that point this is Australian pricing. Like that's not even like American pricing. So like I don't know what like like I don't know maybe it's just aimed for the like the really rich people in India or something. <laughs> But yeah, <coughs> I mean that's I like my game. Yeah, that's how uh, much I spend it. Uh, no, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I'm saying that. Uh, first of all, we have to remember that the 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 audience that this game is for is not the audience that you guys represent. Both of you are very, uh, you know, uh, I want to enter a world. I want to experience something. It's not yeah. really built for your type of uh, uh, gamer. It's pretty much built for the same type of crowd that uh, the two developers, Vincent Bella and uh, forgot the other dude's name. but uh Jason West yeah Jason West uh it, it it's it's the same crowd that they were building uh Call of Duty for is that you know it is a multiplayer game it's fast paced uh there is a level of skill involved but not so much as uh unreal where you uh you know you can't enter and feel not feel you know empowered so uh, you know i i think it's uh, i think we're just being a little bit unfair saying that it's you know this but with better jumping or something cuz you know i i haven't played it but i did i have watched a few uh gameplay videos and it is polished as fuck and it does play well from what i've seen 
it's just not the type of game that I think any of us would go for, especially at that price. Um, it's, I, don't know, I don't know about that. See, like if they were doing something interesting with the multiplayer there, I would have definitely considered buying it. The the point of the point where I decide the Titanfall, there's no way I'm getting Titanfall. Is a it's like a it's on freaking Origin, which means I have to download that damn client to play the game. And yeah. b the, while the gameplay is innovative, like I mean I said that up front. Yes, their gameplay is different from most other shooters out there because they've increased the speed, and you have jumping and jetpacks and stuff like that, and that is really cool. But they've not. They've still not done anything beyond basic multiplayer mode. They have their deathmatch. They have domination. They have all the Call of Duty multiplayer modes that are already in Call of Duty. Like I think it's a, a heavily overpriced game for what it's offering. Hmm. Okay, I can see where you're coming from with that. Like if they were doing something in like like Planet Side Two, wherein these are large hub worlds, wherein there's a constant fight going on between two factions. I would still have considered buying it. They don't have anything like that. There's no persistence to your to your world. Like this persistence to your character because you gain levels okay. as you. But there's no persistence to the world in which you're playing the game. And they have innovated in multiplayer. I like I'm 100% certain. Like they changed the way perks work and they made the titans really interesting. And titans aren't a perk. Everybody can get a titan, and based on your kills, your titan comes faster. That's really cool. But I, I still don't think it's cool enough to warrant the amount of money they're asking for, with the kind of multiplayer modes they have in that game. Alright, that's fair enough. But I would still say that the guys who generally buy this sort of game don't really care for that sort of thing. For them, it's more. Okay, it's the same game, same modes, fine, don't care. But oh shit, now I can, you know, wall uh, wall run and uh, jetpack jump and I can jump on this titan and shoot it from behind and I can be in a titan and, you know, these animations look crisp and this feels perfect. It's, it's more about the moment-to-moment -moment play than the, you know... The overall design. Yeah, no, actually, like a lot of, of Call of Duty's uh, like success came from simplifying uh, multiplayer that used to exist at that time. So I mean, I'm not sure if like like because like if you uh, what you suggest is that like Call of Duty's audience will massively uh, move to Titanfall, which is also what EA's marketing is continually insisting on. So I mean, like yeah, at that's that point, I'm hundred percent sure. Yeah. So like that might not actually work out for them because. Like Call of Duty, at at which time it was um, like it, it became kind of popular with Modern Warfare 4. At that time, the, that multiplayer was simpler and it had the RPG progression thing. Those two things it, it was what uh, sort of enabled it to uh, like take over usual multiplayer right. games. Like, yeah. So see, that's, so, yeah, that's like, true. Really, but that's true. But. What uh, you're also forgetting is that these guys have the pull of being the guys who made the original and left and went all auteur and made a new one. And no, the like, fact that... Uh, but like at the, the average Call of Duty gamer doesn't care. Like they don't even know. Like if, if like Vincent Pella or whoever else, think, like they'll, they'll just see the Call of Duty. Uh, like that's how it's portrayed at least. So I mean, if, if like since we are, but yeah, like let's not discuss like our imagined version of a gamer or something. We'll find out yeah. in two months. Like EA marketing will tell us if it manages to topple to Call of Duty. So yeah, they'll tell us. They'll probably like shout it from the roofs or something. <laughs> yeah, so, that, yeah, that's true. Uh, I guess yeah, we can uh, wait to find out. Uh, on on the note of uh, subscriptions and all, uh, any of you guys interested in uh, WildStar by any chance? Nah, I mean, no, at this point, like, I just, uh, like, yeah, it's just the case that I don't have the time to invest in, M in an MMO. Like, uh, even no matter how good it, how good it is, if I need, like, 80 hours, like, even at 80 hours is the point where I, I sort of feel like, yeah, this is slipping, uh, but like, by, while in college, I used to play, like, 100 hour RPGs and all that stuff. But yeah, now it's just, like, I would much rather just play, a, like, you know, a good game for, like, 10 hours, maybe. Something like that, yeah. So uh, the reason I'm yeah. not getting the reason I'm not getting Wildstar Tages is because I'm getting Dark Souls too. Ah, uh, good point. So, 
Well, I would like to get it. It looks interesting. I'm pretty, uh, you know, pretty interested in uh, what they've talked about so far. But uh, Dark Souls too? You should get Dark Souls too. No, Dark Souls and Wildstar both. But uh, I, that that's where my addendum was coming in. Where I don't know if I have the time to play either. Yeah, the same. Like even Dark Souls two is probably a hundred hour <coughs> game, easily. Yeah, um, and I don't know if I have that much time, but I definitely know I'm going to sink at least thirty to forty hours into it. Mm. Yeah, plus with Dark Souls because it's a single, you know, storyline, you can always go back to it. Well, kind of. I mean, you'll kind of need that uh, learning curve again, but you know, kind of like riding a bicycle, maybe. I'm excited for Dark Souls too, but. At the same time, it's going to cost three thousand rupees in India, and that makes me a little bit sad. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's uh, nice. Yep. Anyway. Uh, yeah, this was uh, really like uh, apparently this just talk happened about uh, some some person named Caustic. Uh, like this person said that the indie revolution might not. Uh, actually, pan out as we are all hoping, because it it at this point it is totally dependent on Steam, which is an interesting thing. I'm actually waiting for this, yeah, because yeah, this talk obviously needs a more like more clarification and all that stuff. Who is yeah. it by? Uh, uh, a guy called Costic, C O S T I K. Like that's all I like. This is from Twitter right now, so I don't know anything else about this person. Huh, that's an interesting point. Uh, like yeah, it, yeah, because uh, yeah, apparently okay, there's one new tweet which says that uh, if a distribution channel is throttled, then you can't really expect a full scale kind of revolution thing, because it's sort of totally dependent on what the whims of that platform holder are. So yeah, that's an interesting yeah view. That might actually uh, by the by the next podcast we might elaborate on this. See, we we'll maybe discuss this. Okay. We 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 will discuss uh, the addendum like that. Uh, Arvind posted. We might discuss it next week if we think it's interesting, or when once we look at the talk, if we think it's interesting, we'll discuss it next week. Uh, Arvind is out next week, I think. Your he's on his way to rest. Yeah, I will. Yeah, I'll probably not be here next week actually. Yeah, by this point, definitely I will be at rest. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, best of luck, man, Arvind. I hope a, a shitload of people play Unrest and you get a lot of good good feedback. I hope everybody loves the game. Yeah, that's what I hope. Best, yeah. best of luck at best of luck at Rest. Uh, meet your team for the first time in real life. That will be a good yeah. thing for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, half of my team actually, not even the full team. It, meet meet what uh, the part of your team that you can. Outside of Jafar, I don't think you've met every, anyone in real life, right? Yeah. So looking okay. forward to that. Like it might actually turn out that there's nobody at the airport, and turns out they were all parts of my imagination. So I mean, yeah, I, like, I'm not discounting I that. Th- I don't think that's going to happen. But like, <laughs> it, it, whatever happens, it, it'll be interesting. Have a great time. Have a great rest. Best of luck. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, all right. Uh, Tejas hasn't said anything because apparently he doesn't want Arvind to have a good time at rest. Yeah. No, I was yeah, kind of waiting point, for you yeah, to finish. So I could kind of hop in there because, you know, just waiting for my turn. But yeah, dude, have a great time and rest. And yeah, uh, yeah do us proud. You have unrest. Show people what uh, Indian games can be. Yeah. All right, man. Yeah. Become, become the Raja of India. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. <laughs> Put the Raja in Arvind Raja Yadav. Oh, <laughs> fuck. No, okay, that's it. We're ending the podcast here. Yeah. All right, guys. Yeah. See you next week. Yeah. Um, good night, everybody. Just signing off. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.